This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon. I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. Welcome to another episode. Likeable Science is all about how science is a vital and interesting part of everyone's life. And I have a great guest today to help me explore this, Dr. Dara O'Carroll. Welcome, Dara. Hi, thanks. Uh, Dara works as an emergency room physician and has uh, a slew of interesting experiences there. We're going to go through some of that and talk also about uh, a very interesting uh, article that Dara wrote recently on ketamine, which some, people, some viewers may know as a party drug. Others may know it as a veterinary anesthetic. Yeah, a little and, bit of everything. Right, and uh, Dara wrote a really intriguing piece about that. But let's, let's start with a little bit about how, how did you get into this whole emergency medicine biz? Um, <clears throat> I guess I can talk about how I got into medicine first. Okay. Was uh, I originally started my academic career as an uh, engineer. And I quickly found out that getting into calculus, whatever it was, 13, 14, not that high, but like, you know, three mm -hmm. at least, I wasn't enjoying it. And so I transferred into a slide of something that was somewhat similar. It was biomedical engineering. So that would be engineering um, prosthetic hearts, uh, prostheses. And it still required a lot of the mathematics that while I could do, I just didn't really feel like I was enjoying. And I'd always was into sports as a young guy. And uh, after that second year in college, I shadowed my father's uh, general practitioner and realized that yeah, I think medicine is for me. I always liked biology. I always liked uh, chemistry as well. And combining that to medicine really kind of fit the bill. And so I, there I was, um, second year in college, just slinging head on into the world of medicine. So that's how it started. Excellent. And I originally wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon, um, but I found it was a little bit too narrow for me. Mm -hmm. um, fixing bones and joints is, while a great service, I kind of felt like I would forget everything else I learned about the body. So emergency physician is kind of akin to a old school physician where in the, you can take care of anything that could walk into the ER, walk, mm. crawl, fly, where it be a heart attack, a stroke, uh, you know, severe infection. I still do get the broken bones and get to fix the broken bones. So it's kind of grabbing everything that's cool and really emergent about every, uh, every aspect of medicine. Yeah, because there must be a lot of a lot of different fields contribute to the advancement of emergency room medicine, right? Yes, yes. So I kind of have to speak the lingo of every kind of specialist. Like mm -hmm. I need to know how to talk to an eye doctor when something comes in about an eye, a fish mm -hmm. hook in the eye. Like what part of the eye is actually hurt? Right. I need to be able to talk to a cardiologist about. All right, this is. I think this guy actually has a heart attack in this artery, mm -hmm. or not a severe heart attack, different types of heart attacks. Mm -hmm. um, I need to be able to talk to a neurologist about where I think the stroke is or you know, what's going on. So get to borrow a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. That's what I, I kind of like about it. And you're useful no matter where you go. You right. know? And at the same time, you get, you get a, a very funny, I guess, <laughs> funny, uh, very intensive but limited interactions with your patients, right? Yes, yeah. I mean, sometimes you get none. You know, they come in unconscious and who you are interacting with is family. Um, and sometimes you've got, you know, 30 seconds, sometimes you've got five minutes, but the, uh, what every good emergency physician does do is somehow make the patients feel comfortable. And when they're coming into the emergency room, by far and large, it's not the best day of their life. It's usually the worst, <laughs> right, you know? Yeah. So I think each emergency physician has their own way of making somebody feel comfortable when they come in. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, but that's, uh, you got to establish that relationship yeah. so you're, you're on the same yeah. team. You know? Yeah, and on the same token, sometimes our, our uh, relationships are, uh, are so quick that we don't get the long-term um, kind of relationship that, uh, you know, your general practic practitioner will develop with you, mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, other specialist or surgeon who follows you for a large, long mm -hmm. time. It's good and bad, but, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I wish that I had a little bit more interaction, but it's okay. Sure. Yeah, and it, it was interesting. Right before the show, we were talking. You were telling me you don't. You, it's not that you show up at the same hospital every day and, and work some sort of regular hours. You, you have a, a very oddly rotating schedule. Yeah, right? Are you yeah. around among sure, yeah, a number of hospitals. Yeah, it kind of uh, depends on which you know which group you work for. And when I say group, how emergency rooms are usually staffed is there's a group of ER doctors that get together, and we call them a group. 
and they approach your hospital and say, hey, we will staff your emergency room. You don't have to worry about hiring any other emergency physicians. And um, um, sometimes it's one hospital, sometimes it's two hospitals. The current group I work for contracts with almost nine hospitals, mm -hmm. around nine. And so uh, I, uh, I like keeping myself on my toes, and I like kind of the a little bit more rural medicine. So I travel to Molokai and Kauai and, and work there as well. Uh -huh. um, and a couple of ERs around here in Oahu. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like that, yeah. Yeah, and it gives you some sense that you'll see a different kinds of issues and cases, right? Yes, yeah, right. yeah. I mean, what I see on Molokai is not the same as what I see here in Oahu, which is not the same as what I see on Kauai mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it keeps me um, whatever can walk in and fly in is, is gonna gonna happen. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so how how does this group though get together initially? I mean, how does how does your mm, generally it, kind of how I initially described it was a group of guys get together and say approach your hospital and oh, say we oh. will staff your hospital. Really? Okay. Yeah. So it's fairly informal. It's not not uh, like an organ. Well, no, there's contracts involved okay. and that sort of thing, but that's the the gist. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then sometimes that's how most ERs work. There are hospitals where the ER physicians are actually contracted through the hospital. Mm -hmm. And then there's some ERs that are just contracted by locums physicians, where physicians will just come in for a couple months and then leave. Kind okay. of yeah. So you get to know these different ERs, and the, the support staff are, are part of your teams? Are they part of the hospitals? Part of the hospitals okay. teams, yeah, okay. yeah. So the, um, there's some continuity there then. Yeah. And they have yeah. their routines they got to go through. Right. right. Yeah, although at the, the amount of hospitals I work in, it's sometimes hard to remember the nurses' names. But <laughs> I always say, forgive me. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So this, um, I was so intrigued by this, this article that you had written. Uh, yeah, it appeared in Tonic, is the name of the, the column, I guess? Sure, yeah. It, it's uh, um, the health vertical of um, Vice magazine. Vice huh. is a digital online publication. Also, it started off as a written publication, but it's their health huh. section, okay. health vertical. Yeah. Okay, yeah. uh, I was wondering tonic now, it makes yeah. sense, right? Tonic, yeah. tonic, I'm not sure isn't. how they came up with that name. Yeah, well, I don't know. Right. Yeah. Uh, but you, you wrote about this uh, uh, drug ketamine, which I uh, gave a great, great summary of its history and how it was developed and initially intended to be used, and sort of this, the recognition these days of a, of a really uh, impressive array of, of qualities as a, as a pharmaceutical agent, right? Oh, it, yeah. It, in that it can. Uh, it's the only sort of anesthetic that we know of that doesn't depress respiration, right? Sure, I, I wouldn't say the only, okay. but it's the predominant one okay. and the safest one and the easiest one to use. Okay. And yeah, it's the reason why it's so versatile is that what you alluded to is the most other general anesthetics where you're talking about propofol, which is the one Michael Jackson used and unfortunately succumbed to. He succumbed to because he stopped breathing. If you take too much of these general anesthetics, it affects your breathing centers of your brain. Right. And you stop breathing, which right. is the same way that, um, you know, say, an opioid overdose right. passes away, is that their brain centers are inactivated. Mm -hmm. Whereas ketamine does not affect the brain center, uh, breathing center of the brain. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> when you use ketamine, uh, many times you do not have, you have to monitor the airway, but very, very rarely do you ever have to um, make any, put somebody on a breathing machine mm -hmm. because of it. And that's when it was first used in, uh, in humans. Um, in somewhere in the early 1960s, um, late, uh, uh, late 60s in the Vietnam War. Uh -huh. um, so they use it for medevac patients and you know there might be somebody who's maybe their arm or leg was completely blown off or severe traumatic injury and giving them ketamine not only put them to sleep and they're able to be transported easier, um, also gave them a lot of pain relief. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I remember Having uh, using it in a when I was working as a research technician uh, as, uh, on we were doing uh, somatosensory neurophysiology oh. on macaque monkeys and we use ketamine. Really? Yeah. 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 I mean, that's how right. it originally started. Right. Was it was a veterinary vet right. anesthetic, yeah, right. and it was first synthesized in the 1920s, mm -hmm. and um, <clears throat> it's a family. Everybody's kind of surprised to, to hear this. It's actually only a few atoms away from. Uh, from PCP. Yeah. So it's the same family of medication as PCP. Mm -hmm. Obviously that uh, PCP lasts, the reason why PCP doesn't really work as well is that it lasts so long. PCP will stay in your system for days, whereas mm -hmm. ketamine will last no longer than 
30 minutes to an hour, at most two hours. And mm -hmm. that's if you get a whopping big dose of ketamine. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so started as a veterinary anesthetic, and then in the Vietnam War is when they really s started to use it on humans. Mm -hmm. And since then, um, Navy SEALs carry it in their mm -hmm. pocket. They're carrying morphine as well, but what they're using mostly is ketamine. Um, yeah, I found that really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you've, uh, this, this stuff is relatively safe for kids. You, you talk in this article about using it on, on squirming kids who are upset. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I would say that I use it uh, predominantly in kids. It's actually a little bit better in kids because kids have smaller muscles. Mm -hmm. The one sort of side effect you can get with ketamine is you get a little bit of locking of the muscles. I wouldn't call it like complete locking, mm -hmm. but the muscles get a little bit stiff. Mm -hmm. And so how I use it in kids is if a kid has a big laceration on their forehead or their face or something in their ear, you know, they, they don't have the mental capacity to be able to, you know, we're trying to help you. If you stay still, we can help you better. Right. And also, they're, you know, terrified. They're in a new place. They're, you sure. know, the bright lights everywhere. They don't know who I am, don't know who the nurses, nurses right. are. Um, <clears throat> so giving them a, a low dose of ketamine, um, putting them to sleep completely safe because their airway is safe. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's a, there's a low rate of complications, and it mostly happens with kids. It's where your vocal cord spasm, mm -hmm. called laryngospasm, on the order of 0.04%, uh, mm -hmm. something to be aware of. But usually give it to the kids. That puts them in a nice kind of gentle, um, relaxed state. They're asleep, and whatever is kind of the big laceration on their head, we're able to take care of that, stitch it up really well. Mm -hmm. uh, take the foreign body, whatever it is, a pebble or rock or seashell that they put in their nose. ears, <laughs> or up their nose, or anywhere, <laughs> and uh, get it out. Yeah. Uh -huh. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Yeah. And so why, why is there sort of controversy? Why, why, it sounds like this is like everyone should be like, hey, this is great, this is good yeah, stuff. Yeah, um, I mean, before I was in the world of medicine, I knew it as a, as a horse tranquilizer. And if anybody ever mentioned, mentioned ketamine, or as it's known mostly in the, on the street drug, Special K, they'd be like, oh my gosh, that's such a hard drug. Mm -hmm. But um, being more familiar with it now and using it all the time, it's like, you know, as I alluded to, a very safe medication. Mm -hmm. um, it's also abused quite highly in the rave scene and most predominantly in southern China and uh, Southeast Asia because that's where the, most of the world's ketamine is, is produ uh, produced. Mm. So instead of using you know, a lot of the um, club drugs like ecstasy and, and cocaine, they're using a lot of ketamine over there. Oh, I see. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Now, this is why China wants to move it up to a Schedule 1 or something. Yeah, yeah, they've been harking at it for years. I don't think they'll ever get it because mm. it's it's listed on the World Health Organization as one of the top. They had, the World uh, WHO comes out with a list of about 130 to 180 uh, medications that they say are priority medications and that every medical system should have it. And ketamine is on that mm -hmm. list. Mm -hmm. and. Especially in, in third world countries or resource poor areas, ketamine provides so much use for not only pain relief, but allowing, sometimes they don't have access to these general anesthetics and gases that our surgeons and anesthetists mm -hmm. use in the United States and in the first world. Ketamine doesn't need to be refrigerated. It doesn't need to be, um, as, as long as it's in a vial, it can be out in the sun for a little while, but it's very easy to be transported. Mm -hmm. um, and so in these third world countries, it's used quite a bit. And I don't ever think China will actually get, get it. Yeah. But I don't know if they've given it up yet, but I know over the last couple of years they've been trying. Yeah, and again, I was interested in the article. You, you, you said it sometimes uh, it's dispensed in pill form, too. I, I never... Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I you, never... Can, you can actually get it huh. in pill form. And the predominant way they use the pill form is it's also been uh, used in depression. Hmm. And so they've been shown, it's shown that ketamine... And this is in the drip form. They can do a slow titrated drip in the, uh, 30 minutes. Um, the actively severe suicidal ide uh, ideation patients who are actively having suicidal thoughts, who have not been responsive to traditional medications, who have not been responsive to the electroconvulsive therapy, and that's where they put mm -hmm. the two electrodes sure. here, using ketamine, uh, gets rid of the suicidal ideations mm -hmm. in 30 to 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. We're going to dig more deeply into this, but we have to take a little break right now. Uh, Dara O'Carroll, emergency room physician, is with me here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, and we'll be back in one minute. Aloha. I'm Winston Welch. And every other Monday at 3 p.m., you can join me at Out and About, a show where we explore a variety of topics, organizations, events, and the people who fuel them in our city, state, country, and world. So please join us every other Monday at 3. 
and we'll see you then. Aloha. Good afternoon. My name is Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green, a program on Think Tech Hawaii. We show at 3 o'clock in the afternoon every other Monday. My guests are specialists both from here and the mainland on energy efficiency, which means you do more for less electricity and you're generally safer and more comfortable while you're keeping dollars in your pocket. Welcome back to Lakeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Think Tech Hawaii. Talking to Dr. Dara O'Carroll here, uh, emergency room physician extraordinaire. Uh, and we've been discussing sort of the practice of emergency room medicine, and we're just before the break talking about ketamine and uh, the, the fact that it's quite safe, uh, has a lot of good uses. You, uh, you were saying it's used actually to treat depression now, too. So this sure. is this sort of, a, it's a growing array of, yeah. of uh, appreciation for, for sure. the power of this, of this chemical. Yeah. Not only depression, but also uh, chronic pain, because how ketamine works in the brain and in the central nervous system is that it blocks a receptor called the N MDA, those four letters, mm -hmm. MDA receptor. And those receptors are not only in your brain, but also in your nerves and your arms, legs, all over throughout your body. So uh, people with chronic pain, fibromyalgia, um, phantom limb as well, mm -hmm. they've been, uh, experiments have been showing good results with ketamine because they are blocking those pain receptors mm -hmm. in, in the, throughout the body. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so uh, delivered how in that case? By that, the, that is usually by pill. pill huh? okay. Yeah, by pill. Um, you can also, they also do a drip as well with that, okay. but usually by pill. Um, also, if somebody comes in with severe asthma, and what, a, uh, what asthma is, is really a disease of the airways just constricting. Every, uh, the small airways of the lungs have, are lined by these smooth muscles, and mm -hmm. when somebody has an asthma attack, something is triggering those muscles to clamp mm -hmm. down. And so ketamine, um, if somebody is severely bad enough where the breathing machine isn't working, the albuterol, the breathing treatments, um, I'll jump to one, mag uh, magnesium, but two, ketamine is the next thing that I'll actually give, and it does help dilate the airways. So don't go asking for, you know, ketamine to replace your inhalers, but uh, <laughs> uh, only in severe life-threatening asthma. You had written another article, though, about uh, for, uh, the, the oxygenation machine that they... That they who said this was a machine that had been around for since like the 50s. Oh yeah, the ECMO machine. ECMO, uh, right. Yeah, ECMO, E-C-M-O, uh, extracorporeal oh. membrane, membrane oxygenation. Right. And what that pretty much means is oxygenating blood right. without the use of the lungs. Okay. And so um, ECMO um, is having a resurgence. It's so uh, it's been used in, in, in um, in uh, operating rooms quite frequently because, you know, putting people on the pump or on bypass, mm -hmm. that's what an ECMO machine is mm -hmm. traditionally, a bypass machine. But uh, recently, since uh, probably the mid, late 90s, to early 2000s, uh, there's a couple of different hospitals that are pioneering this, one in um, San Diego, Sharp Hospital, and uh, uh, one in, um, in, I believe it's in Atlanta, uh, where they are uh, bringing ECMO machines down into the emergency room, a, a venue that they've never had before. And these <laughs> machines, as you alluded to, are from the 50s. Mm -hmm. They've gotten smaller, definitely, but you know the technology is pretty much the same since the 50s. Everything's just shrunken. Mm -hmm. And if somebody comes in and their lungs aren't working, or their heart isn't working, um, it, put them on the pump. Like there was a, one instance of a young guy who had such a severe asthmatic attack um, everything that they tried wasn't working, and these, uh, this uh, allergic attack actually was from, he ate a bunch of peanuts, uh, unknowingly, mm -hmm. that they put him on the pump because his lungs had just stiffened up so much, nothing was working. They put him on the pump, let the uh, allergen kind of perfuse out of his system over, a lot, over two to three days, and uh, once his lungs were able to function again, they made sure that those were working, and the pump saved his life. ECMO, mm -hmm. so, to, so to speak. Wow, yeah. wow. Yeah. Somebody comes in, like say uh, a young uh, a young girl comes in, or or male comes in with a, a heart disease. Sometimes you can get viruses that attack your heart, and your mm -hmm. heart will actually you can be young and healthy, but your heart will actually be so stricken with this virus that it's unable to pump well, and you get uh, you'll pass away from it. Mm -hmm. um, that's another great indication for ECMO. If your heart or lungs aren't working, put them on a machine that can substitute for either one of those. Yeah, because you don't want to. Yeah. Uh, you, you got to keep the blood oxygenated. Yeah, if you don't, it's, yeah. you know, it's over pretty quick. Yeah, it was, whoever, um, Zach Shiner and um, Joe Belezzo really are the pioneers of it in San Diego. And 
it's really a case of just human pioneering. Mm -hmm. Nothing really changed in technology. It's like, hey, we have this machine. Why aren't we using it over here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And again, that's sort of actually like what you were talking about before the show a little bit, right? This uh, the increasing use of these sensory deprivation tanks, right? Yes, yeah, uh, no, which, sensory... Which initially were sort of a woo-woo kind of thing, you know? Yeah, yeah, they were a woo-woo kind of thing, and they got gained popularity in the 80s, I believe, and then they kind of waned, and now they're coming up again. But uh, So what a sensory deprivation tank is, if nobody's uh, familiar with it, is it's a enclosure, whether it could be metal, it could be fiberglass, it could be just canvas basically something that's very, very dark. It's usually four foot by eight foot, filled with 10 inches of water, and that water has got about 1,000 pounds of Epsom salt in it, so it's like the Dead Sea. When you sit in there, no matter what type of body type you are, you're gonna float. Mm -hmm. It's heated to your skin temperature, which is not 98.5 degrees, that's your core temperature. Right. It's um, uh, 93.5, so you're not feeling anything, mm -hmm. and you're not hearing anything because you got earplugs in. Right. So, um, we'll forget taste for now because that's not your taste. You're not tasting right. anything either. Right. There. Um, so sensory input is completely taken away. Yeah, and it's made so uniform and unchanging that your body yeah. very rapidly sort yeah. of zeroes it out. Exactly. Yeah. And so, what does your body? What does your mind do? Specifically, there's a couple areas like your reticular activating system, which is kind of deciphering what's your environment and what's important in your environment. What does it do when it has nothing? You're used to having things going on. What does it do when you don't? Right. This is yeah. this is a it's a it's an un an unusual, indeed almost unheard of state for us in this day and age, particularly right when we've got all the all this sensory stimulation happening, these distractions. You've got people around. You got your phone. You got your laptop. Sure. You got all this stuff going on so much of the time. And yet, as, as you were pointing out, that's not a sort of natural level of stimulation in some level. No, some no. Level, right? uh, physiologically, our, our brains are the same as when we were walking around the African savanna, oh. when we only had one object uh, in our mind, what we're hunting, what we're gathering, or what we're running away from, maybe right. two objects. Right, right. And now that we have all these things, all this stimuli coming at us all the time, I think it's really, really important to find ways to detach from that. Put your phone away. I'm not saying everybody has to do a sensory deprivation mm -hmm. tank, but I think the way our society is going and a constant input, being able to kind of take a break mm -hmm. and devoid yourself of any sensory input makes you appreciate what sensory input is important. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, I'm, uh, uh, I like it personally, but mm -hmm. also they're showing there's great research going on with uh, the treatment of anxiety, mm -hmm. all sorts of anxiety, OCD, um, general anxiety disorder, bipolar disorder, uh, excuse me, not bipolar, um, all the whole spectrum, and showing good results on uh, PTSD especially, oh, yeah. and also depression as well, showing mm -hmm. some good results, almost as good as taking the standard depression medications. Mm -hmm. And you were saying something that some athletic teams are now using these with their, with their players? Yeah, so. yeah, so Steph Curry has been a huge proponent. Uh, he's, he even has some commercials where he's doing it, and been featured on ESPN doing it as well. And so he says mostly kind of what I'm alluding to personally, like it helps him calm down and helps him relax, but um, there's some, some great physiological and exercise research coming out of the University of Cincinnati and University of Ohio, and, can, and they're teaming up with the U.S. Special Forces. So these guys are, you know, um, the United States is putting money into, us, into this mm -hmm. research to make our Special Forces as good as they can be. And mm -hmm. you know that, you know, we always need them to be on the top of their game. Right. And so they are using sensory deprivation tanks to as recovery tools because mm -hmm. these guys are pretty much uh, elite athletes you know they're putting mm -hmm. 80 pounds in their backpack mm -hmm. and you know climbing you know eight miles right. or, you know and they got to do that in two or three hours right. so that's a really strenuous activity and so they're putting people in these sensory deprivation tanks and the, um i won't give out all of the uh the, all of the uh, research isn't completely out but basically the athletic trainer who's behind this is saying and he's been an athletic trainer for 35 years that the results that they're seeing makes him want to take out and rip out all of the cold tubs in his facility mm -hmm. and replace them, the cold tubs being those big ice baths that they sit mm -hmm. in, rip those out and put in, replace them with sensory deprivation mm -hmm. tanks. So if he thinks, based mm -hmm. on his preliminary research, that he wants to do that, the guy's been working for 35 mm -hmm. years with all these elite college athletes, mm -hmm. there's got to be something to it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it makes sense. Again, it's, it's a, you know, it's sort of, it's what you were alluding to earlier, sort of taking a, Technology from one area and putting it into into other uses, or somebody saying, "Huh, maybe maybe this could be a good thing to." Yeah, you know. it's it's recycling different. Uh, I want to say 
taking other people's or stealing other people's <laughs> ideas, but it's just finding new uses for everything that yeah. we have. Yeah, yeah, which is, I mean, that's, that's human ingenuity, right? Yes. That's what your, yeah. your bioengineering it's, program was going yeah, to teach you right now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That's that's intriguing because uh, uh, yeah I, I had used a sensory deprivation tank many years ago to, uh, for uh, chronic neck pain and mm -hmm. it was one thing that finally sort of yeah. broke me out of that cycle. So yeah. even the Epsom salts in there, the magnesium that's in there has shown to improve skin turgor, skin tone, huh. and muscle relaxation as well. Really? Oh, yeah, well, more more good. I might, yeah. might have to revisit these things. I think so. yeah, give it a <laughs> shot. <laughs> um, and so. What is the, uh, so it sounds like this is very, uh, uh, I don't want to say throwing, but, but a very fulfilling career for you. Can, can you. can you give a maybe a quick highlight story? Um, highlight story? Um, yeah, it has been a very fulfilling career. Um, being able to help people at their most dire times of need um, is very rewarding. Um, and can affect a physician in, in ways that you, you can't really imagine until you're kind of there and doing it. And um, it does make you appreciate the day-to-day -day and the beauty of day, everything day-to-day. -day. And that, I don't want to get morbid in any way, but you know, things happen every day. So appreciate everything mm -hmm. that you have and you know, that you have your health or, or, or your family and, and mm -hmm. everybody, especially in this uh, you know, coming up against the holidays. Yeah. So. No, you was in the emergency room treatment must bring to mind how fragile we really are, right? And, yes. and you know, how easy it is for things to go vastly wrong. Yeah, yeah, and especially yeah. when there's drinking involved. <laughs> <laughs> so you, before we go, I, I want to ask an off-the-wall question, though. Sure, off-the-wall, right. okay. Here it is. Not a lot of thought into this. If you could have the superpower of either being able to fly or be invisible, which would you choose and why? Fly. And why? I've had so, so many dreams about being able to ah, fly. You have flying dreams. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. My wife does too, yeah. yeah. Uh, I've never, I never have had these dreams. But. I don't know what it means, but <laughs> <laughs> there's some dreamer uh, psychologist out there who can probably tell us, All but right. yeah, flying for sure. Excellent. Super. Yeah. Well, Dara, it's been great having you on the show. I've learned a lot, as I always do on my shows, and mm -hmm. you've been a wonderful guest, and uh, sound, sounds great what you're doing. You're doing important work, and most happy to have you here. All right. Thank you. Thank All you for right. having me. And thank you for watching Likeable Science again here, and we will see you next week. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, signing off.